Hello everyone, this is Professor Roman. Let's continue the group theory lectures. We're ready now to take a look at Chapter 9, Direct Products, Cauchy's Theorem, and Finite Abelian Groups. We'll begin with Direct Products. One of the principal techniques used to analyze the structure of a group, G, is to decompose the group into a join of hopefully simpler subgroups. So in symbols it would look like that. Such a representation implies that every element A in the group can be written as a product, x1 through xn, where each factor xi belongs to either h or k, or possibly both if their intersection is non-trivial. But unfortunately, the value of a general join decomposition or representation such as this one is very limited. So we should construct a wish list for doing this decomposition. And the first item on the list is that the join decomposition should be a simple set product. <clears throat> so G should be the set product of H and K, so that every element, little a and G, is just a product of little h times little k. The second item on our wish list is that the products in H, K should be unique. So if we have H and H prime in the subgroup capital H and K and K prime in capital K, if those products are, if these two products are equal, then the H factors must be equal and the K factors must be equal. So we'll refer to this very desirable property as unique representation for the elements in the set product. Finally, since the business of group theory is taking products, there should be a nice, simple formula for the product of two elements. So if little a is h1, k1, and little b is h2, k2, where the hi's belong to h and the ki's belong to k, then we want to have a simple way to express the product ab in the same form, an element of h times an element of k. So we want a simple way to determine, say, h prime and k prime, for which this product is equal to h prime k prime. Now, of course, the ideal would be if the elements of h commuted with the elements of k, because then all we have to do is swap k1h2 here, and we have this simple formula. And since this is our wish list, we want that property. When the elements of h commute with the elements of k, we're going to say that h and k commute element-wise. I don't know that that's a standard term, but it's so descriptive, I think most people would understand what that means. But it's important to note that this does not require the elements of H to commute with themselves, nor, nor the elements of K to commute with themselves. So neither H nor K need be abelian, it's just that an element of H must compute with, uh, commute with an element of K. Notice also that element-wise commutativity is much stronger than permutability of the subgroups H and K. <clears throat> so that's our wish list. And what can we do about it? Well, the first thing is to notice that element-wise commutativity implies that the join will be a set product. So wish number three actually implies wish number one, and all we have left then on our wish list is just two and three. That's still a lot, but at least it's a little less than it was before. So our wish list consists of unique 
representation and element-wise commutativity. Okay. Suppose now that the set product HK does provide unique representation for its elements. What would that imply? Well, if you think about it for a while, you might notice that if there is a non-identity element A in the intersection, then we can write this equation, and we have violated unique representation. Here, 1 would be in H, and A would be in K. Here, A would be in H, and 1 would be in K, and we have violated unique representation. So unique representation implies that H and K are essentially disjoint. But the converse also holds. If H and K are essentially disjoint, and if we have this equation here, HK equals H prime K prime, we can put the H the elements of capital H on one side, the elements of capital K on the other side. And so this element belongs to the intersection, therefore it's equal to 1, and therefore H is equal to H prime and K is equal to K prime. So unique representation in HK is actually equivalent to essential disjointness of H and K. And it's worth noting that this applies to any two subgroups H and K of G. You don't have to have G equal the set product of H and K. The set product might be a sub proper subgroup of G, and that doesn't matter. So G doesn't enter into this computation here. So we have a lemma, or maybe it should be a theorem, I don't know. Um, if H and K are subgroups of G, then the set product has unique representation if and only if H and K are essentially disjoint. So that dispatch is one of the two items on our wish list in the sense that it gives us a simple characterization of unique representation, something we can get our hands on. Suppose now that G is this set product HK, and that HK has both unique representation and element-wise commutativity. So then the unique representation part tells us that G is the product here, H dot K. We're using this notation uh, when H and K are, rel are essentially disjoint. Moreover, the element-wise commutativity relation implies the following. HK H inverse is just equal to K, because H and K commute. That's in capital K. And similarly, there's a symmetry here between little h and little k. K H K inverse is equal to H, which is in the subgroup capital H. These look suspiciously like normality conditions. And in fact, we can write them this way. Um, if we conjugate K by H, so what this is, this is a set of all conjugates that look like this. That's a subset of K. And similarly, we swap the, ro the roles of H and K. So this says that H normalizes K. But K normalizes itself. And so G, which is this set product, will normalize K. In other words, K is normal in G. And a similar argument shows that H is normal in G. So when we have our wish list, unique representation, element-wise commutativity, we then know that G is the essentially disjoint set product of H and K, and H and K are normal in G. Again, the converse holds. 
So let's suppose that we have this situation here. Then, because H and K are essentially disjoint, we do have unique representation. That was our earlier lemma. As to element-wise commutativity, because H and K are normal, if we write K inverse H, K, H inverse, we can associate this in two different ways. K inverse H, K belongs to capital H. Multiplied by a in, a H inverse, we're still in capital H. Associate the, the in a different way will be in capital K, so we're in the intersection, which is trivial. And then we push the K inverse H inverse the other side, we get the commutativity relation. H and K commute. So we have element-wise commutativity. So in summary, then, our wish list will come true if and only if this holds. So we better give this a name, because it's extremely important. Let G be a group and let H and K be subgroups of G for which this holds. Then we say that G is the internal direct product of H and K. And each factor is a direct factor of the group G. Also, if G is additive, we'll often or generally say this is the internal direct sum. Uh, we faced this sum product crisis when we first defined external direct sum products. Um, so I won't rehash all of that, but uh, in essence, we can always say direct product, even when we're dealing with addition, because product is sort of a generic term for the group binary operation. But if we are dealing with an additive group and we remember to do so, we can say internal direct sum. And then each factor would be called a direct sum end. <clears throat> I put the word internal in parentheses because generally uh, you won't hear that word all the time. People will just say direct product and assume you can figure out whether it's internal or external from the context. And in fact, we're going to see in a few minutes that the two concepts are actually equivalent, essentially the same concept. <clears throat> there is no notation that I'm aware of for the internal direct product or sum. So I chose this bow tie uh, partly because I searched through my word processor's symbol list and that was the only one that jumped out at me. I don't use LaTeX or LaTeX, however you say it. Uh, so I am limited in the symbols I can use. Uh, I like this symbol anyway for reasons I'll mention in just a moment. So here is the upshot of our discussion so far. G is a group, H and K are subgroups. G is the set product of H and K. Then G has unique, rep then um, this decomposition here. It's not right to say G has unique representation. It's H, K that has unique representation and the subgroups commute element-wise if and only if G is the internal direct product of H and K. This is exactly or precisely when we get our wish list. Okay. As to this bow tie notation, um, I do sort of like it because if you pull it apart, it's really composed of two normality signs. It tells you H is normal and K is normal. Uh, unfortunately, the triangle by itself without the underline it, uh, we use for proper normal subgroup. And here we, H and 
neither H nor K need be proper. But because they are essentially disjoint, if H, for example, is all of G, then K is trivial. So that case uh, is boring. Uh, so it, there's a little, a little, you know, peccadillo here we have to overcome, but it's not serious. So that's the notation we'll use. Uh, the <clears throat> internal direct product decomposition is the ultimate in join decompositions of a group. There are other ways to decompose groups, which we won't go into at this point. There are chains of subgroups and, uh, and other things you can do. Uh, but as far as decomposing a group into a join, uh, this is the ultimate. Uh, you have unique representation and you have uh, element-wise commutativity, so the product is easy. If you understand the individual groups, H and K, separately, you understand they're essentially disjoint, uh, join their, uh, their d internal direct product. Unfortunately, though, it's generally not possible to decompose an arbitrary non-abelian group into a direct product of non-trivial subgroups. So when this does happen, we're quite fortunate. And we will see it happening. <clears throat> There's something else. I, I don't remember, frankly, whether I brought this up. I think I bring, brought this up later in the book. But there's something that's close to the internal direct product. And that is when, you ha when the subgroups are essentially disjoint, but only one of them is normal, one of the factors. Uh, you don't know whether the other one is or not, so you will often have to assume it's not. Or that's called a semi-direct product. That's a more complicated construction for obvious reasons. Normality simplifies things. And, uh, but I, I believe I discussed that briefly later on in the book. Okay. That is a much more common decomposition than the internal direct product. <clears throat> Let's th look at the relationship between internal and external direct products. The separation or independence of the factors that occur in an internal direct decomposition, something we talked about a little bit, you know, these are essentially disjoint, so there's a lot of independence here, and uh, uh, if they weren't disjoint, essentially disjoint, there'd be interactions that would make life much more complicated. And it wouldn't just be a matter of understanding H and K separately. You'd have to understand their interactions. So this reminds us of the separation in the external direct product of two groups. H and K or subgroups of D, they're, they're groups in their own right. You can take their external direct product as well. And there's a clear separation because you stick the elements on two sides of a comma. You separate them by a comma and enclose them in an ordered pair. Uh, so this isn't an accident. If, we, uh, if G is the internal direct product of H and K, we can define a map from the external direct product to the internal one, or the other way around, but I did it this way that takes the ordered pair HK to the product HK. This is an isomorphism, and I'm going to leave that for you to verify. And so the external direct product of two subgroups of a group <clears throat> is isomorphic to the internal direct product. There's one other thing I should mention um, oh, it's coming up. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, oh, I missed it. It's right here. <clears throat> I mean, let me back up for just a second. If H and K are subgroups of a group G, then the set product always exists. But sometimes we will say something like the internal direct product H bow tie K exists. That has more meaning. It means that 
H and K are essentially disjoint. Okay? It's not required that the uh, internal direct product be the full group G. So when you hear the phrase H direct product K exists, it implies, without mention, that um, H and K are essentially disjoint. And it is the set product of H and K. Okay. It does not imply that that set product has to equal the whole group. Okay, sorry for that. Let's come back here now. So what we have seen is that if G is the internal direct product of H and K, then that is isomorphic to the external direct product of H and K. From the other perspective, the other way around, <clears throat> if we have an external direct product of two groups, now they don't have to be subgroups of anything at the moment, and, they, and uh, then this is an internal direct product as well, not even isomorphic, it is an internal direct product of these two normal subgroups of this. H <coughs> direct product trivial group, this is external, and so is this. So in symbols, the, the external direct product of H and K is the internal direct product of this group and this group. These are subgroups of this one. And this is an equality, stronger than an isomorphism. So in this sense that we can go back and forth between the two concepts uh, in a unique way, they are essentially the same concept. Internal direct products are far more useful in studying the structure of a group We've just been discussing that. We, if we can find a, an internal direct product decomposition of the group, we've done quite, quite well. External direct products are more uh, for creating new groups out of old ones and things like that. But it's just a point of view. It's, it's essentially the same concept. <coughs> There are some other important isomorphisms involving internal and external direct products that we're going to have some important use for. As a matter of fact, the next result, which is somewhat uh, technical, um, we're going to use it to prove another result, and that is a result on cancellation in direct products. And uh, this is a very interesting result, which I'll elaborate on later. And that, in turn, will be very useful in proving one of the cornerstone theorems of group theory, namely the classification problem for finite abelian groups. <clears throat> so here is the first result. Um, the, these results are... I don't know how one should say it, ugly, maybe. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of symbols going on here. It can sometimes take a while to get used to all the symbols. As we go through the proof, you'll see that, too. Um, they're not terribly deep mathematically, but they're hard to read, you might say. So suppose G is the internal direct product of two subgroups. H1 and H2. First, if H1, if N1 is a normal subgroup of H1 and N2 is a normal subgroup of H2, then we have an isomorphism here. This is H1, H2, I'm just going to read it that way, mod N1, N2, and that's, this is, these are internal direct products isomorphic to the external direct product of H1 mod N1, H2 mod N2. So basically we can split along the internal direct sum 
symbol, but we have to convert to an external direct sum, and that's an isomorphism, not an equality. <clears throat> As a special case, you can insert a, a, a trivial subgroup here and apply this. So H1 direct product H2 mod H1 is isomorphic to H2. That's cancellation of H1. But again, don't take that too literally. Swapping denominators. If N1 and N2 are normal in both H1 and H2, and we need that, you know, the, the normality conditions here, you may say, well, I hate to have to memorize all that. Well, they, they are they're exactly what's required to make the quotient sets into quotient groups. So that's what we need and no more. So what we can do here is this is an external direct product of these two quotient groups. We can swap the denominators. And what we get is isomorphic to the first. So if <clears throat> it, um, we can swap denominators in these two direct factors, as long as both denominators are normal in both numerators. Otherwise, it wouldn't even make sense. <clears throat> to prove part one, we can define a map from this side to this side. An element on this side, you know, if, if it's a little bit hard to read here, you, you can drop these bow ties and just stick H1 next to H2. It's a set product. But you have to then remember they're essentially disjoint and commute element-wise. But it, it might help you see that this is a typical element in this quotient. It's an H1, H2 is the coset representative for the uh, subgroup N1, N2. And because these are normal, this product is a subgroup. And we split this H1, N1, comma H2, N2 that will belong over here. And this is an isomorphism. Here is the proof, but I'm not going to go through it because I would urge you to do so as practice. Uh, see if you can show that this is in fact an isomorphism. Okay, and you'll need to use, obviously, the normality of various subgroups and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and I also left part two I didn't even include the proof of part two. I'm leaving that for you as well. Okay. I, I think it's time, now we're, well, maybe close to halfway through the course, that you begin to do a little more and I begin to do a little less um, in, in the lectures. Uh, the materials, uh, some of the material is still in the book, like the proof of this first part. Proof of the second part I left out of the book because I wanted you to do it. Uh, but uh, it's if you're serious about really understanding group theory, you've got to start participating more than you might have done before, or at least than I asked you to do before. Okay. So I'm not doing it to be nasty, even though I always have some students who think I am. I'm doing it because I want you to participate more. <clears throat> now we can look at this business of cancellation in direct products, and we will need that previous theorem for this. This is a very interesting fact that I have not seen in any textbooks on group theory. I haven't seen them all, so it may be in textbooks. Um, but I read about it in, I would guess, the original article, journal article, where it appeared some time ago. Um, it's 
but it is turns out that it's uh, of great advantage in the proof of the classification problem for finite abelian groups. You can prove that theorem without the cancellation that we're going to talk about. But I think this does simplify that proof a little bit. That's going to be a nasty proof. Um, there's no way around that, but I think this will help to some extent anyway. And the cancellation theorem, I think, is interesting in its own right. Uh, the proof that I saw in this article was rather difficult to follow. This is what I hope is a little bit more intuitive version of that proof. This is not my own proof. It's not an original proof. It's still the, the uh, it belongs to the person who first did the proof. Uh, but I tried to make it a little friendlier. Um, I don't know whether I succeeded or not, but the, you'll be the judge of that. So, here we go. Of course, cancellation is a property in groups. If you have elements A, B, and C, if A, C equals B, C, you can cancel and A equals B. The analog of cancellation for groups is the following. A group G is said to be cancelable in direct products or just cancelable if for any groups A, B, and H, A external direct product G isomorphic to B external direct product H and G and H isomorphic implies you can cancel G and you have to cancel H at the same time. Uh, so you get A isomorphic to B. So you're canceling the second factors. Uh, you might think the terminology is not quite right here. Maybe you should be saying G and H are cancelable. But the problem is that um, G, you think of it this way, G is a specific group you are studying. H can be any group isomorphic to G. So, I don't know, you could say maybe G and any group isomorphic to G are cancelable, but that's a little wordy. So this is the way it uh, was presented to me, so I keep the terminology. <clears throat> now, when it comes to proving this, it's easier, I think, to work with internal direct products rather than external. That's arguable, but uh, I, I think it is. And there are, in fact, two different equivalent internal versions of this result. Remember, internal and external direct products are essentially the same concept. So here's the first internal version, and for that we need a parent group, W. If, if W is the internal direct product of A and G, and it is isomorphic to the external direct product, I'm sorry, to the internal direct product, B and H, okay? and if G and H are isomorphic, then A and B are isomorphic. This, there's an isomorphism sign here. Okay. And I probably should have said B and H are also subgroups of W. Otherwise, that's not very clear. Okay. Here's a version that just involves equality. It's the same as this version, but there's an equal sign here instead of an isomorphism sign. Oh, I guess I did say it down here, so I need that. Okay. So the only difference is this equality instead of an isomorphism. Now, all three of these are actually equivalent. Okay. And so let's spend a little time going through that. It ultimately, at least in part, depends on the fact that there's an isomorphism between internal and external direct products. Uh, <clears throat> and when I first wrote this proof, I just referred to 910, 911, and 912, and even I got a little confused which one was which. And So I think it's 
um, may be helpful to give these three uh, statements a name. So I'm just going to refer to this, rather than just calling it 910, I'll call it the external version. And you know what that means, the external version of this statement, okay, of cancellation. And I'll call this the internal, because of the internal direct sums, isomorphism version. And I'll call this the internal equality version. And hopefully that will make the reading of this a little bit simpler. So <clears throat> first let's show that the external version and the internal isomorphism version are equivalent. If the external version holds, then we want to show that the internal isomorphism version holds. So we're allowed to assume the antecedent to show the consequent. So we get to assume this. Therefore, and since we're going to, we're going to, and then we can use this, the external version. So notice that the external version, the external direct product, A product G, is isomorphic to the internal version. And that now is isomorphic to BH because we're assuming the antecedent. And that is that internal version is isomorphic to ex internal direct sum isomorphic to external. So I said direct sum, I should have said direct product. You know, I was raised with the term direct sum, so sometimes I lapse into that uh, when I shouldn't. <clears throat> so the external version then implies that A is isomorphic to B. If you look at the first and the last here, that's exactly what's written here. These are the same in all three cases, so we don't have to really uh, fuss with that. Uh, so from the external version, we get A isomorphic to B. These are the, con the, the consequence are all the same, too. Okay. What about the converse? If we have the internal isomorphism version and we want to show this holds, we get, again, to assume that the antecedent holds to show that A is isomorphic to B. <clears throat> so in this case, here is the external direct product, and it is equal to this internal direct product of these two. We did this before, but we are uh, assuming the antecedent in the external version, so we get to assume this are isomorphic, and this is equal to this. So, and we also have this, of course, is isomorphic to this. Again, this is one of the parts of the antecedents in all three cases, and that's equal uh, isomorphic to this. So, if I drop this stuff in the middle, it'll be more readable, somewhat more readable. We have one internal direct sum equals another, and we have the second factors are isomorphic, and so the internal isomorphism version implies that the first factors are isomorphic, which in turn gives us A isomorphic to B. Okay. So that means the external version and the internal isomorphism version are equivalent. As far as the two internal versions being equivalent, one direction is obvious. If, if the isomorphism version holds, the equality version will hold because uh, if these two are equal, then they're also isomorphic. So we get this conclusion, A isomorphic to B.
It's the other direction. If we only know the equality version, can we deduce the isomorphism version? <clears throat> well, so <clears throat> we're going to suppose the internal equality version holds and then assume the antecedent in the internal isomorphism version holds. So there is an isomorphism then, sigma, from here to here. Therefore, the, this internal direct product is the image under sigma of this one, and because this is an internal direct product and not just a set product, it's equal to this, and I'll let you fill in the details. And also, G is isomorphic to sigma G, or, but G is isomorphic to H, so sigma G is isomorphic to H. So again, dropping this mid, these middle items, <clears throat> we can imply, apply the internal equality version, because we have equal signs here and deduce from that that um, sigma A is isomorphic to B, right here. But A and sigma A are isomorphic by sigma, by the restriction of sigma to A. And so A and B are isomorphic. So all three of these versions are equivalent. Uh, you may have to go over this a few times if you're really interested in in uh, in learning it well. The, none of this stuff was in the paper, original paper I read. Uh, the author did everything with external products, but he still used some things that um, could be confusing to beginners who are not quite used to going back and forth between internal and external versions. Uh, so I wanted to ex make the internal versions explicit. Um, <clears throat> and also, the author of the original paper glossed over the issue of whether this was an isomorphism or an equality. And so I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to show explicitly that it didn't matter. So, we are now ready for the actual theorem on cancellation. Assuming that all groups mentioned below are finite, then the following equivalent statements hold. I, I guess maybe I should mention um, finite groups are cancelable. Infinite groups are not. Even infinite cyclic groups are not cancelable. And uh, I left, I, there's an exercise in the book that will guide you through an example and help you uh, prove that that's the case. So this is, this is really a property of finite groups. So these are the three versions, the external version, the internal isomorphism version, and the internal equality version. We've seen their equivalent. So to prove that these hold when G is finite, and when all the groups are finite, um, we just need to prove number three. It's the equality version. So we have a little more ammunition rather than having to deal with an isomorphism, we can deal with an equality. In fact, that's probably, as I think about it, the reason that we would prefer to switch from external to internal so that we have equality here. It will make life easier. So let's assume then that the antecedent here holds. Okay. <clears throat> and so that's the antecedent. Then we have to show that A is isomorphic to B. And we're going to do that by induction on the size of the group G. 
and therefore also H, because they're isomorphic, they have the same size. What we would like then, since we want to assume that this, it, it certainly holds when the order of G is 1, because it's trivial, that's trivial, they just go away. Uh, so we'll assume the result holds for any group of order less than n and assume that the order of G is n. So what we'd like to do in order to apply the inductive hypothesis is to get a setup like this where X and Y have order less than the order of G. As a matter of fact, even if we had a couple of uh, factors here, A direct product x1, direct product x2, isomorphic to b, direct product y1, direct product y2, just two, two factor, two extra factors. If the x's and y's have degree, have order less than n, we can cancel one at a time. So we can cancel any number of factors we need to as long as their size is less than the, the size of g. So this is what we'd like to find. Well, in order to get fact from this, in order to get factors that have order smaller than n, with the order of g, we could try taking quotient groups. So I'd like to take a quotient of both of these. It's a quotient of w, a quotient of both of these expressions for w. So we need a subgroup, a normal subgroup, which I called S. And uh, somehow it's got to relate to both of these expressions. Okay. So this is where it gets into the realm of, of uh, difficulty. Uh, this is the point at which inspiration maybe is necessary, or just trial and error, or luck. This is where we're beginning to get into the realm of it's not obvious what to do. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what works. And maybe other groups will subgroups here S will work too. But uh, you take the intersection of G and B and take its internal direct product with the intersection of A and H. And you have to check that this actually exists. Well, in other words, that this set product is essentially disjoint. G intersect B is essentially disjoint from A intersect H. Okay. And I'll let you ponder that. <clears throat> and uh, also that this is normal in W. So we take this expression here, this, and we just factor by S all the way across. We get something that looks like this. Now, we can split, but I also can reorder. So I've got a lot of ways I can split this. And I'm going to split it doesn't look that great to split and have A mod G intersect B. It looks like we might get more mileage if we do if we swap these two and so split A and so split it so that we get A over H intersect A. And then this way we get G mod G intersect B. And we do something similar on the other side. So we have some common, something common in the numerator and, and denominators. Okay. Now, at this point, uh, we're drifting away, let's say, from something that looks like this. Oh, sorry. Because this has an A and a B. So I'd sure like to get rid of these two denominators, but there's no place to put them. However, and this is another somewhat clever idea, we're going to use this 
isomorphism. G and H are isomorphic. So I can tack on another term on both sides. This is an isomorphism, not an equality. So if I tack on another term, it's going to remain isomorphic. So I, I tacked on H and I tacked on G. They're isomorphic. And I did it in the form of a quotient uh, because that's what these are. But the denominator is the trivial subgroup, so it doesn't do anything. This is isomorphic to H. This is isomorphic to G. And I have this isomorphism. Now I can swap denominators. And I'm going to swap these two. And I'm going to swap these two. That's over here. Okay. So now I have A and I have B, essentially. So by rearranging... And now this, these are external direct products now because <coughs> I passed, when I did the split here, we passed to external direct products. So actually, both versions of direct products are turning out to be useful in their own rights, their own strengths come through. So I have A here and I have B here which is what I wanted, and I have these other quotients. Well, H, their H and G in the top, they have order equal to the order of G. H, G and H are isomorphic. So, provided that these denominators are non-trivial, this quote, these two quotients have size less than the size of G. And I can imply the inductive hypothesis to cancel those two, and then I can apply it a second time to cancel those two. And I have my isomorphism A to B. So we're almost done. But we have to deal with the case where one or both of these subgroups are trivial. Then we can't cancel because the, the size of the group of the, of the quotient group is equal to n, and the inductive hypothesis does not apply. Well, <clears throat> suppose, for example, that G intersect B is trivial. And so uh, this set product is actually an internal direct product. So that's when I said, remember the remark I made that when the, about uh, the existence of an internal direct product it just means that the two factors are essentially disjoint. I'm not claiming this internal direct product is equal to anything in particular. These are subgroups of... <coughs> Um, of W. Okay. Well, if we look again at the antecedent, because all the groups are finite, the size of W is the size of B times the size of H, and uh, H and G are isomorphic, therefore they have the same size, so I can replace that by the size of G, and that is the size of the internal direct product B and G, because we know that exists. Okay. So, since this is a subgroup of this one, but they have the same finite size, they're actually equal. <clears throat> and that, in turn, uh, this is W, it's equal to this direct product. So I have these two direct products are equal. If we factor this by G, then we have the cancellation from the earlier theorem. We cancel these two Gs, cancel these two Gs, we get B isomorphic to A. 
So that took care of that problem. Same thing, same kind of argument, analogous argument, if these two have trivial intersection. So that's the proof. And now maybe you can see why this doesn't appear in most textbooks uh, at the undergraduate level, certainly, but I'm not even sure I've seen them in graduate textbooks. Uh, it, it, so it's, it's a little unpleasant. Um, it's not deep mathematically, but there are a few points where you have to say, how did he think of that, you know? <clears throat> so that's cancellation of um, in internal direct products, and uh, you are now you are now familiar with some things that most people are not familiar with.